All right, I'd like us please this evening, if we could just look at the book of 2 Kings just for a moment, 2 Kings and chapter 2, uh, and very familiar, I think, to most of us. Uh, we're very well versed with this passage, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 9 down to verse 14. It says, it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass as they still went on and talked that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more, and he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. He took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him, and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither and Elisha went over. And again, God bless that short reading uh, as we consider our topic for this evening. And uh, first thing, I just a couple of comments about that little passage. I'm just really using it as a uh, kind of an introduction to what I really want to speak of this night. Um, but just a couple of things. First of all, um, when he was asked, you know, what can I do? What shall I give you? What can I do for you? He wanted a double portion of his spirit. It's interesting how he was told by Elijah, you've asked a hard thing. And I was thinking in our prayers, um, we're asking a hard thing. It, it's so contrary to everything we see around us. Everything we see around us is declension, is departure, is failure. And we're asking the Lord to do something really hard, not for, not for him really, but it, it seems like a hard thing. It's not a simple thing to change the whole scene, to bring revival. That's what we're asking him to do. And it, it, and it seems to be a hard thing. And it's good to ask a hard thing. And of course, he's given his answer. And when he um, uh, gets the mantle falling upon him, he says, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And I mentioned the other day, and I still uh, feel like it's a very valid question. We know where the God of Elijah is. He's still seated on the throne. He hasn't lost any of his power. Uh, he's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. Really, the question is, where are the Elijahs? Where are the Elijahs? Where are the Elishas of our generation? And so I want to think about that in terms of, uh, think, I want to think about the 1859 revival a little bit tonight. And I want to talk about one of the Elijahs or the Elishas of that generation. And this man's name is Duncan Matheson. Uh, and here's uh, where I got a lot of my information from. Uh, this book, Duncan Matheson, The Scottish Evangelist by John McPherson. It was just a tremendous read, and I really heartily recommend it. It's published by John Ritchie, uh, but if you're, if you're stingy and you're Scottish and you don't want to pay uh, for John Ritchie, you can actually get a free download online, and I can post the link to it uh, later. But uh, just a little bit about this man, Duncan Matheson, one of the many Elijahs and Elishas that God raised up during that time of marvelous revival in 1859. And he was described as the Scottish forgotten evangelist and very little known, unfortunately, about this is probably one of the few records apart from a few articles I came across on the internet uh, and yet tremendously used of God. McPherson wrote about him. He was his friend and associate for many years and he had access to his journals uh, when he was a younger man uh, and so that's where he got his details from. And uh, one of the things that he mentioned about him is that really a lot of the reason why he's the forgotten evangelist was that oftentimes when he saw tremendous blessing, uh, he would detail much of the power and blessing resulting from the ministry. 
And he would write to his wife and tell her about these amazing events that were occurring in the 1859 revival. But at the end of the letter, he would always say to her, destroy this, because he didn't want people to, to think anything of him. He wanted them to get a sense of the greatness of God. And so he wanted to disappear from the scene. And so he certainly wasn't a self-promoter. And he would not have done very well in our Twitter age, you know, where uh, the slightest thing is, is on social media. Uh, he wanted to hide in the background and he wanted the Lord to be the one who got all the glory from his ministry and his life. So a little bit about his early life. He was born in Scotland in 1824. And at that time, the Church of Scotland was in a very terrible state. Uh, the liturgy was very dead. Uh, most of the ministers were liberal. Uh, they certainly didn't want to speak about hell or eternal realities. And so uh, certainly the, the, the scene was bleak, but he did have one thing going for him. He had a very godly mother who was a true believer. And also he came across uh, the, or under the influence of a fiery preacher of that day named George Cowley and uh, heard gospel messages uh, in his youth that left an indelible impression in his mind. And yet he didn't make a decision for Christ. And uh, he conver conv um, converted with, uh, with godless friends and hung around with them and, and, and held back really from knowing uh, that he needed to accept Christ. And he just kept resisting it. And, uh, and yet his conscience never left him alone. And part of that was the influence of his mother. Uh, when he was a child, he asked his mother, what is eternity? And of course, that's a great question. And so she gave a tremendous illustration that never left him. And she said, uh, she pointed to a mountain that was close by. This guy grew up in the Aberdeen area, showed him a mountain and said, he said, uh, imagine a bird going to the top of that mountain and just pecking off one speck of dust, carrying it with him to a different place, and then going back every single day, get another speck of dust and continuing until the mountain was flat. And he said, if you can imagine that, eternity has just begun. <laughs> and that illustration his mother gave stayed with him through the years. And his mother was also one who suffered from consumption or TB, which was very common in those days. And of course, with TB, there was always this chesty cough. And so whenever he was thinking of getting further into kind of the pleasures of sin and ungodliness, if he heard somebody cough, it immediately reminded him of his mother and his mother's prayers. And it kept him from going any further into sin. And uh, he, he made the comment, by the way, the, the man who wrote the book, he said, he said, I wonder what Peter thought every time he heard a cock crow for the rest of his life. I never thought about that, but I would imagine that it brought all kinds of feelings to Peter's mind as well. But anyway, just hearing somebody cough would, would keep him back. And again, just by the way, as a, a, an aside, uh, we cannot put a great a value on the prayers of godly mothers and the impact that they have had through the generations. And I think that's just a wonderful thing. His godly mother, he could never get away from her prayers and from her influence. And so his mother wrote pleading letters to him. And then while he was away uh, working, a Christian couple uh, took him in and boarded him and their influence and his mother's pleading. Eventually, he started going to hear preaching by a man called Horatio Bonar. Uh, some of you would remember him. He's a wonderful hymn writer. Quite a number of our glorious hymns were written by Mr. Bonar, of course, part of the Bonar brothers, Andrew Bonar. Uh, and Horatio Bonar. And under the preaching of Mr. Bonar, he came into deep soul trouble. And he went through a period of two years of incredibly intense conviction uh, before he finally was saved through the words of John chapter 3, verse 16. How many people have found rest for their soul in that great verse, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But sadly, uh, within a few days of the joy of deliverance and the joy of salvation, 
he entered into another two years of doubts and personal conflict and confusion. And part of the difficulty was, instead of looking to the word of God and the finished work of Christ, he started looking within for assurance. And he was involved in introspection. And uh, actually, there's a marvelous little section. And I'm going to take the time tonight, brothers, to read this, because I found this very, because I feel that um, the paralysis of analysis, the danger of over introspection is paralyzing many of God's people. And so this is when he said another Christian air passing away charged him to warn the believers against raising the foundations. I often did it, she said. I rashly denied the Spirit's work in my soul, and I have paid dearly for it. This she said in reference to the excessive and morbid, morbid introspection in which some Christians indulge to the hurt of their souls and to the discredit of the gospel. They pull up faith by the roots to see if it's growing. I thought that's interesting. They pull up faith by the roots to see if it's growing. They pluck out their eyes to see if those eyes are genuine. Peace and joy depart from them. Dark suspicions of God as if he watched for their halting overshadow their hearts and they're plunged into misery. Growth in grace becomes impossible. For as one has said, kindly thoughts of God lie at the root of sanctification. Self-examination is important, but surely not less important is faith. Looking to the heart and looking out to Christ should go together. The pilot at once keeps his eye upon the compass and his hand upon the helm. If he neglected either, he would speedily lose his course. Keeping the heart must be coupled with holding the head. Examine thyself should never be separated from looking unto Jesus. The best way of testing the picture of our faith is by dip it, dipping it often in the well of life and drawing its fill for constant use. Anyway, I thought that was beautiful. And I thought, you know, and again, it's it's true in our day. There are people that they're, they're always looking inwards and they're always struggling with doubts and they never make progress instead of looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And so anyway, once he had settled this after two years of uselessness because of introspection, um, he finally settled the matter and <laughs> the work of Christ was enough. And that's where his, his joy came from. And he immediately began to spread the gospel once his doubts were settled in his home community. And one day a devoted Christian lady asked him to speak to an aged group of, of ladies uh, who were not saved. And she gathered them together in like a cottage meeting, meeting, and she wanted him to preach. And he declined. He said, I can't preach. And she pressed him to consider their soul's welfare. Don't you care about their souls? She said, he relented and God gave him liberty and power to preach a clear, stirring gospel message to these ladies. And that was evidence for him that the Lord had a work for him to do. There was a, a very well-known lady in Aberdeenshire called Lady Gordon. And she was one of these aristocrats, a bit like Selina, Countess of Huntington, and Theodosia, Lady Powerscourt, who, although they had great rank and uh, society and all the rest of it, uh, they loved God and they loved the gospel. And they cared about souls more than position and rank and the opinions of men. And she saw a great potential in this young man, and she encouraged him to leave his work as an architect and to go out into gospel labors. And she supported him financially and encouraged him to preach the word of God. He had earlier done very well academically at school, and people had pressed him to go into the ministry, but he didn't want to be a hypocrite because he knew he was not a saved man. And why would he go into the ministry if he didn't have the message to give? And so it was only years later after he was saved, and this woman encouraged him that he began to preach. His trademark of how he would work, he would go into a community, he'd get any believers together, call them to a noontime prayer meeting, and then he'd have a gospel service, could be in a barn, could be uh, in an old schoolhouse or whatever. And then he'd have a prayer meeting afterwards. And that's how he would work. And he went all around the area of Aberdeenshire preaching the gospel. But one of the great lacks in that day 
was materials to distribute like gospel tracts and things like that. And he was so burdened, he began to pray about this. Lord, how I couldn't afford to buy tracts because what little income he had, he was such a generous man that if there was people in need, he'd give it all away and he wouldn't have any funds for tracts. And so one day a man uh, offered him uh, an old uh, print printing uh, machine and um, it would needed some work and he got it and he worked at it and he learned to become a printer and he printed gospels gospel booklets all that kind of thing some nights he would go all night trying to get this machine working efficiently and and producing tracks and sometimes he would produce up to 2000 tracks a day and he's writing these tracks himself and then arranging the type, and it was kind of one thing at a time and getting it all set. And uh, so uh, he had much uh, prayer about these tracks, and he distributed them all around the area in Aberdeenshire called Huntley, where he lived and had a real exercise. He also was burdened about missions and was very interested in China. But uh, during this time, a war broke out, and it was a, a war that Russia was instigating they wanted to expand into the ottoman empire and they started what became known as the crimean war and just as an aside i've had so much fun today learning more about the crimean war because i want to know the background and so was, i've just had a wonderful day uh, in preparing for this but uh, anyway um the crimean war broke out in 1854 and he watched soldiers marching off to war and the Lord burdened his heart for the souls of those soldiers. And he began to pray, even though he wanted to go to China, but he prayed, Lord, would you open an opportunity for me to go as a chaplain to share the gospel with these soldiers who are going to the Crimea to fight? And he got an answer in a most remarkable way. A letter came in the mail to the Reverend Duncan Matheson, inviting him to go as a scripture reader to the forces but it wasn't addressed to him it was written to another reverend duncan matheson but was delivered to him by mistake <laughs> but anyway he went to uh, the person who sent the letter and said this is a mistake but it may be not a mistake because my heart is for those soldiers and after being interviewed the guy said no this is the providence of god we got the right duncan matheson and he was sent with the blessing uh, to go labor uh, in the crimean front amid the daily horrors of war ravaging both camps his journal portrays the more desperate horror of hundreds of young men each day facing death without hope. In fact, as I did some research today, 10,000 men died before a single shot was fired of cholera in the camps. And so it was a decimating war and men were going into eternity in droves. And so this really affected this man uh, he made rounds through the makeshift hospitals, giving tracts and New Testaments to those who could read and reading to those who could not. And of course, one of the things that this war exposed was the lack of backup that there was, the lack of supplies and all the rest of it. And some of these guys were hungry. They hadn't eaten for days. Uh, their clothing were in tatters. Uh, him being a generous guy gave his own clothes uh, to uh, the extra ones he brought to these men. And he would go to the ships and beg the men on the ships for supplies for the soldiers. But the main work was uh, saving souls and he spent three years there. And by the age of 33, the strain of his work uh, began to cause him to fail physically. And from then until his untimely death, age 45, his health remained very brittle. During that war, he handed out 52,000 tracts, 622 Bibles, 1,477 New Testaments in English and thousands more in French and Italian because it was a, a war in which Sardinia, Italy had, didn't become a nation till 1870, but Sardinia joined in uh, because they spoke Italian uh, with France and Britain to fight Russia. 
when he came back from the war, in, it ended in 1857, he returned to Scotland and the stage was being set already for the Great Awakening. News had come of events in America with the uh, pr businessman's prayer revival and things like this. And it was beginning to, uh, just the whole idea of awakening began to grip the souls of the saints in the United Kingdom. And so people began to earnestly pray for revival, for the church to be revived out of its lethargy, for an awakening amongst lost sinners, for backsliders to be, just like we're praying for. This was, this really captivated and began to grip uh, people. And God raised up some amazing evangelists at this time. And I'm going to mention just a few of them. There were amazing characters. In fact, we, we could do these Saturday nights and do a different one every Saturday night and probably keep going for six months. Uh, there were so many men, Elijahs, that God raised up at this time, and all from amazingly different backgrounds. Brownlow North, uh, he was a, a converted aristocrat uh, who proclaimed tremendously earnest message about the fact that God is real. Uh, that was his message, that there is a living God, that he's real. And then Reginald Ratcliffe, uh, he was a converted lawyer from Liverpool, and he preached the message that God is love. And then another guy, Hay McDowell Grant, he was the Laird of Andilly, another aristocrat. He set forth, salvation is free. And then, of course, there were men like Richard Weaver, the converted boxer, John Hambledon, the converted actor, and just a, gr a huge group of men, all committed to the gospel message and preaching Christ and him crucified. And of course, Duncan Matheson joined this band of men preaching the gospel. And his message was one of judgment and eternity. He never forgot his mother's illustration of eternity. And he was a man who was gripped with the thought of eternity. And so he preached that and took his part in this work and service of the gospel. And as a result, multitudes in the northeast coast of Scotland came to saving faith in the Lord Jesus. And so there was a recognition. This was a move of God. And he, he was so impressed with what God was doing. Uh, uh, God taking the field, as it were. People falling on the conviction of sin in the open air as they were preaching. And so he was so moved by that, he began to kind of go out further afield, preaching to multitudes. And in 1860, he went to the town of Cullen, and they said, this is what they said in the secular press, it was like the town had been moved by an earthquake. And the earthquake was the preaching of Duncan Matheson. It had shaken the society to its very roots. In Huntley, the place where he'd grown up, he preached to crowds of 10,000 people. Now, this is the place where he'd handed out all those tracts all those years ago on this handmade tracts on this printing press that he had done uh, to no really result. He had sown the seed, but now, several years later, he's re reaping the harvest and uh, crowds would come, Duchess of Gordon again, she would offer the Castle Park at Huntley, and for four years in succession, crowds would come uh, to, in the summer, to special fairs she would set up for the preaching of the gospel, and he would preach in tents, in barns, in village greens, in churches, all over that area, and was tremendously used of God. He also wrote thousands of letters of encouragement to his converts, to his fellow workers, and to his family. He had a tremendous passion for souls. He was convinced of the need of the solemn preaching of sin and righteousness and coming judgment. He also printed lovely cards that he would leave in different places, also billboards. He believed in literature, getting the word of God out. And one of his favorite cards he, he had printed, and this is what it said. It said, a God, a moment, an eternity. A God, a moment, an eternity. A God who sees thee, a moment which flies from thee, an eternity which awaits thee. A God whom you serve so ill, 
a moment for which you saw little profit, an eternity you hazard so rashly. Reader, where will you spend eternity? In heaven or hell? Which? And so <laughs> this man also produced a monthly magazine called the Herald of Mercy, and it was for gospel outreach purposes. One of the things about him that really stands out is his passion for souls. He once said, I do not know if 10 minutes of my life ever pass without thinking of the salvation of souls. Oh, that's a challenge. I do not know if 10 minutes of my life ever pass without thinking of the salvation of souls. Another of his quotes is, some men conceal their religion as they would a scab. Eloquent about the merest trifle, they have nothing to say for Christ. They are the devil's dummies. Right. He didn't mince his words. He was a definitely a, a blunt Scotchman. Some men conceal their religion as they would a scab, eloquent about the merest trifle. They could talk about anything, but they have nothing to say for Christ. They are the devil's dummies. So in conclusion tonight, are there any similarities? Well, we're living at a time where there's a war of Russian expansion, just like there was in the Crimea. People are seeking a revived church and an awakening. They realize the church is very ineffective and the need of awakening is desperate. People are sowing seed. Thank God for the ones that we know that are out there regularly sowing the seed of the word of God. And what we're waiting for is a fresh move of God in the Elijahs who will be ready to seize the day when it comes. And so as we go to prayer, let's keep those things in mind, because perhaps we're at a similar point in history as Duncan Matheson and his band of men who carried the United Kingdom with the gospel of the Lord Jesus in a marvelous way. Even so, Lord, do it again. Amen.